This is Jesus Christ, the true lover of your soul, segment 11. As we are seeing the relationship between God Almighty and his only begotten son is absolutely vital to understand. And that's why for almost 2,000 years, the devil has done everything he can to obscure and distort that relationship. Here is a great sentence. The devil knows that if we correctly understand who God is and who Jesus is and how they love one another and relate to one another, it will enhance our relationship 
with each of them and empower us to live for them. And as we have seen, the convoluted, that's putting it mildly, idea of the Trinity is the primary means by which the enemy has nullified people's understanding and appreciation of the heart-to-heart -heart relationship between our Father and His Son. Jesus modeled that perfect relationship with God so that we could follow suit. We may not get it perfectly. We can't. I mean, we've all failed. But we can keep getting better and better. So where did Jesus learn to love like he loved? I think he learned from his father. And of course, the scriptures that he saw as he saw men and women who stood for God, um, love people with the love of God. And then Jesus obviously figured out before I did <laughs> that it took far more love for God to give his son than to turn into a baby, which would have been ridiculous and impossible anyway. And we've talked about that and how God's heart must have been rent. We've also mentioned that Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, than that he lay down his life. And then Jesus modeled that also. Some time ago, I heard a Bible teacher use the term, by the way, let's go to Philippians 3, Philippians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I heard a gentleman use the term informed worship, which I thought was profound. The word worship is the Greek word that's basically used for worship. It's, it's made up of two words, toward and to kiss, to kiss toward. But it's translated worship, and it means to give honor to or to pay honor. Homage to the English word comes from worthship. It's an older English, your worthship. Someone is worthy of respect or honor or even discipleship. So Philippians 3 3 is an interesting verse, and we're going to be reading um, mostly in the church epistles in this segment and the next, and maybe from here on out, uh, because the church epistles, as we will see, are the words of Jesus to us who are members of his body. And Philippians 3.3 3 says, For we are the circumcision. I have quotes on the circumcision in my Bible because it's speaking figuratively based in the context there. And there are three characteristics mentioned here, three aspects of this. We worship God in spirit, number one, and speaking in tongues is one way that we do that. We worship God in spirit. We rejoice in Christ Jesus, and we have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. There's a lot more to that verse that I cover in the Roman seminar about how it parallels to Abraham being circumcised. And there's three points in each case that are three points back in their Old Testament about Abraham that fit these three things. It's really cool, but I can't spit it all out to you right now. So look at Galatians chapter one and we'll get there momentarily. Now, the word here for worship in Philippians that we just read is a Greek word, latruo. It means to serve or to minister to. It's in Romans 12.1. It talks about your reasonable service. The only reasonable thing to do, Romans 12.1, is based on what God has done for us in Christ, is to do something in response to glorify them. And so this verse here is the only verse in the church epistles speaking of worship other than 1 Corinthians 14.25, which says, 
if someone comes in, a person that's not familiar with the Lord or the Word or your fellowship or whatever, and everybody speaks into his life prophetically, he will fall down on his face and worship God and say, Holy Hannah, how'd you know that? And say that God is in you of a truth. Now, we've talked about how God has exalted Jesus and made him Lord. And we'll actually read that in Acts chapter 2 in a few minutes. Because we understand the distinction between God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to worship, to honor, to exalt in, to boast of, and to serve both God and our Lord Jesus. And we are supposed to build intimacy with each of them. But we do so with the crystal clear biblical understanding of who's who. Christians who have been subjected to Trinitarian ideology just mix up words, God, Lord, this, that, calling Jesus God and God Lord, and it just confuses them. Well, we're not confused. We know why we worship, give honor and exaltation to God, and why we worship and honor Jesus, primarily because it was God's idea. Remember Joseph and the Pharaoh? Whose idea was it for all the people to honor Joseph? The Pharaoh. Well, same thing here. John 5, 23, we read it. It was God's idea to exalt Jesus. And when we honor Jesus in the way God intends us to, we honor God. Conversely, if we diminish the role God intended Jesus to play in our lives, we dishonor both him and God. Now, you remember we talked about the chart and how Jesus completely understood his role as the Messiah to Israel. What he didn't know, remember, was the secret. He had no idea he would be the head of the body of Christ, a worldwide bunch of psychos who he would have to count on to make him known. And man, there have been some great ones, haven't they? Many famous Christian men and women who have served God faithfully. Yeah, a lot of them didn't know the word that you're learning here. I don't know why, but God's going to reward people for what they did with what they have. I've said it before. Here, I'll say it again. I think Jesus, when you stand before Jesus, he's going to say, what'd you do with what you knew? Because remember the lady that put the ointment on him? He said she did what she could. Well, if you don't know something, you can't act on it. But praise God for so many priceless people all over the world today who love God probably more than I do and are faithful in their particular calling. That's who will be rewarded. So, the question then is, who is Jesus to the church, the ecclesia, the assembly, the body of Christ? Remember, because Jesus was the first one up from the dead, right? But he was just a head. I'll say it, he didn't want to roll around heaven all day. Never mind, it's an old song, whatever. He needed body parts to do the job. And so he went to the cemetery and he found dead Jews and dead Gentiles. He said, who wants life? You raised your hand. A lot of people raised their hand. Here you go. Making a body of believers through whom and in whom he can now manifest himself when we cooperate. How happy do you think he is when we cooperate? It's unbelievable. I mean, I can't even imagine. He's like, he's doing it. He, he's doing it. He's got angels up there he's talking to. Look at this guy. He's, he's... All right. So now, what's he doing? So we're going to Galatians 1, 2 verses. We're going to be streaming through 
the church epistles here, and we'll do it chronologically uh, eventually. So, Galatians 1, 11 and 12. I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me, I guarantee that it was not after or according to man. People didn't make it up. Paul is saying, I didn't make it up. Just like Peter said in 2 Peter 1, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by Holy Spirit. People didn't just sit down and make up what we find in the Bible. Verse 12, he, he clarifies this. For I received it, not of man, neither was I taught it. I got it by revelation from whom? Now, I know people who were in the same denomination that I was in once who went to the moon after they left because they said, well, we have exalted Paul and praise God for what, if you were back in the day there, we had the church epistles drummed into us until they were running out our ears. Whereas most Christians are mired in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus ain't talking to Christians there. He is talking to Christians in the church epistles. And so people backlashed to the moon. Now we must exalt Jesus and we must obey the words of Jesus. Excuse me. Romans through Thessalonians could all be in red letters. That's what this says. Okay. So there's no dichotomy between Jesus and Paul. There's actually total unity. So Jesus is the revelator to us. Ephesians 1. Now you're back home. Those of you who have been around for a while, you're back home in the church epistles. You're not searching around in Habakkuk or somewhere. Here we are. Ephesians 1, 15. The question is, who is Jesus to the church? And we're about to get to what is he doing? But first, who is he to the ecclesia? Ephesians 1, 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's so cool. I'm Jesus' God. I'm Jesus' dad. That's amazing. The Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That's us. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. All he needs is cooperation, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenlies far above all the creep spirits that have racked and ruined humanity forever. Far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also which is to come. 22 and 23, watch it. And has put all things under his feet and gave him to be what? The head over all things to the assembly, the ecclesia. If the word church brings to your mind some kind of religious connotation that's goofy, get rid of it. The assembly, the group of folks, which is his body. He's the head over the church, the ecclesia, which is his body. Do you see the oneness there? The church is not the bride of Christ, a bridegroom and a bride. That's two. Yeah, they'll become one flesh in marriage, but that's different. This is oneness at a level they never knew. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. Verse 1. The word if is actually, it's a usage, I don't know the grammatical stuff, but it should be translated because. It could be since. 
but people don't use since and because as precise so they interchange them when it should be because and since is more of a little bit of a time word and so there's your grammar lesson so here we go since because you're risen with Christ there's no if ands that buts about it seek those things it's assumed by this construction here since you're then risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God not just that doesn't mean he's just always sitting never doing anything you know that by now right sitting down indicates authority there set your thoughts I'll change this when necessary here in the King James on things above not on things of the earth for you died and your life has been hidden with Christ in God when Christ who is our life shall appear then shall you also appear with him in glory verse 16 let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and whatsoever you do do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by him 23 4 and 5 kind of amplify that it says whatever you do do it heartily as to the Lord we work for Jesus now you probably have a job you're employed and you go there and they tell you to do something and you do it and they give you money at the end of the week that's fine but your attitude is that you're working for the Lord and if you have that attitude a good decent honest boss fortunately there are too many that aren't in that category but a good boss will recognize that and bless you accordingly so we're working for the Lord why verse 24 knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ but he that does wrong receive the wrong he's done there's no respect of persons Jesus is our life Jesus is our master Jesus is our rewarder and believe me he's chalking it up look at Acts chapter 2 and uh, you can you might as well keep your place here because we're coming back to Philippians 2 but we got to go back to Acts 2 Jesus is chalking it all up nothing will be forgotten remember we read that Hebrews 6 God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love so who is Jesus to the ecclesia Acts 2 Peter on the day of Pentecost 29 he says men and brethren let me freely speak to you the patriarch David he's both dead and buried you've all seen his tomb on the tour verse 30 therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up Christ the Messiah to sit on his throne he's talking to a bunch of Jews he's telling them hey the Messiah 31 he saw this before seeing this before he David spoke of the what resurrection of the Messiah that his soul that he's telling them you know when David was talking about that back in Psalm 110 or 16 whatever it was his soul was not left in the grave neither his flesh he's talking about Jesus and the resurrection 32 this Jesus has God raised up where we all are witnesses therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received from the Father the promise of Holy Spirit Jesus passed it on he has shed forth this which you now see and hear because this was the initial outpouring of the gift of Holy Spirit the birth of the Christian church and about 3,000 folks got saved that day and spoke in tongues 34 David is not in heaven now, would that be news to a lot of Christians 
Of course they think David's in heaven. Or else he's like on some kind of side road on the way, parked over there. I don't know. But he said himself, Yahweh said to my Lord. There's the dynamic duo, even in the Hebrew scriptures, in prophecy. Sit thou on my right hand till I make your foes a footstool. 36, therefore let all house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The word Lord is kurios. It means boss. It's translated sir many times. Term of respect, sir, boss, that kind of thing. Back to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And I should say this, it's, it's sitting here. In the church epistles, if you don't know this, listen to this one. How do I know? I don't know. What are you going to say? In the church epistles, other than quotes from the Hebrew scriptures, the word Lord, which is used about 365 times, never refers to God. Always to Jesus. We just read it. He is, back in the Old Testament, Hebrew scriptures, He's Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God. But now he made Jesus Lord. That's why the book is titled One God and One Lord. That's why you have two hands and not another one coming out of your chest. Okay, so Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, just wonderful verses. This is the last section, and then we'll get to what's Jesus doing as boss. Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God. Don't go to the moon with that like a lot of theologians do. It's very simple. We already read. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. By his words and deeds, he looked like God, meaning he did what God would do, said what God would say, had he been able to be there. People ask me sometimes, well, now, I'm not sure when I should talk to God or about something, when I should talk to Jesus about something. I mean, does one of them clock out at 2 p.m., the other's in, Jesus heals above the waist, God, be no, no. And so what I like to say is, first of all, they're both on the same page totally. So I like to say, so I'll say it. If you ask God something, he'll tell you what Jesus would have said if you'd asked him. And if you ask Jesus something, he'll tell you what God would have said if you'd asked him. That's how much in unison they are. So, in the form of God, because he always obeyed and perfectly reflected. And look what it says. He did not think equality, King James is not so hot here, NIV much better. It says even in the NIV, which is aggressively Trinitarian. He did not think equality with God something to be seized or grasped. Who did? The devil once upon a time when he said, I will be number one. I will, I will, I will. And God said, you won't, you won't, you won't. And that was the beginning of the end for that guy. So, but Jesus made himself of no reputation, doesn't have anything to do with him leaving heaven and becoming a baby. That's paganism. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. He didn't go around, I'm the son of God, get out of the way. You're washing my feet, I'm not washing yours. No, no, no. Made in the likeness of men. We read that in Hebrews chapter two. And being found in Fashion, schema, a schematic. As a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Remember, three times in Hebrews 2, had to be a man so he could die. Even the horrible death of the cross. Wherefore, because Jesus did that for God, God also highly exalted him and gave him the not a, the name, which is above every name, that at the name, one translator 
puts it, that at the name given to Jesus, but either way, that at the name of Jesus, every knee, that actually makes more sense. The name given to Jesus, every knee should bow, things in heaven, earth, and under the earth. There's a lot in that verse also. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is God. You can't get it out of the Bible. Now, you can continue to believe that if you want, but don't say it's in the Bible. Just say, I believe something that's not in the Bible. Okay? To the glory of God the Father. So how do we bring glory to God? Not by saying Jesus is God. I know most people mean well. They think they're elevating Jesus. They're not. They're diminishing both him and God. And so, one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Apparently, you have already done that. So we're going back to Romans. And we will begin a mad dash through the church epistles. Romans chapter 1. Now we've read these verses before, so I'm going to try to skim some of these things. <laughs> I got a whole page of verses here. But we can get through it, no problem. And here we go, Romans 1. The question is, what is Jesus doing now? Remember, we just read, he's Lord. So, what we could do, and that's what this list of verses, and they're, they're in your syllabus. I looked at the word Lord through the church epistles, and I looked at the verbs for which Lord was the subject. And that's how I figured out, it's genius. That's how I figured out what Jesus is doing as head of the body. Okay? So, uh, Romans 1, it says, remember that uh, Paul called to be apostle, promised the scripture according to his son, Jesus Christ. Verse 3, born of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of the Holy Spirit by the resurrection from the dead. By whom, it's through whom we have received Grace and apostleship so we can go wild all over the place. So Jesus gives us apostolic grace, the privilege to be sent forth. Second Corinthians, we've already read it, 3, 17 and 18. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Second Corinthians 3, we read that one. He changes us from the inside out. As we look to him, he changes us from the inside out as we look to him. Now, a lot of people, at least many that I used to know back in the day, we didn't learn anything about what Jesus is doing now. And this was kind of eye-opening to me and to many other people when we just follow the word Lord along in the church epistles. So, Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. To whom? The Lord. The Lord. So he receives our songs of praise. Chapter 6, verse 8, Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive of whom? Whether he be bond or free, as I've said, he rewards us. And 6, 23 and 24, peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. So Jesus gives us peace and love. Philippians 2.19. Philippians 2.19. I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. Jesus sends us forth and connects us with other members of of the body. Now, you might be thinking, 
Well, sure, that's the head-body relationship. The head is, in generally, governing the body, the brain, the nervous system, all that. You know, yeah, we communicate. Your toe gets stubbed. Whoop, the message goes back. The head tells the body what to do. Colossians chapter 2. We'll even go into the Timothys here. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the what? Lord, so walk you in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Jesus builds us up and strengthens us in faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. When you're driving along by yourself, you might just kind of imagine Jesus sitting next to you there. Depends on how you're driving. But, uh, and the more we can imagine, I forget, J.B. Phillips, maybe it was, I'm a famous old theologian in the 50s. My mother was quoting him back then. Uh, somebody wrote a book about practicing the presence of God. And we want to practice the presence of God and Christ because they are always with us. And the more we realize that, the better. So 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, Old English, God, who is our Father. So Jesus gives us hope, chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Now God, himself and our Father, now God and our Lord Jesus, is how it reads, direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love toward one another, toward all men, one to another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. So Jesus, again, directs our way. He connects us, and he helps our love for one another increase. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 16. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God. Are you getting the fact that this is the dynamic duo, that deal, one and one is two? You got that? One God, one Lord. Okay? I, I know you got that. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. That's what we're supposed to be all about. Good words for people and good works. And I've written a lot of notes of condolence to people who lost a loved one. And I've often prayed, and I pray that the Lord Jesus will comfort you as only he can do. Now, of course, Jesus is who he is, and he's heartbroken when anybody dies. But if he did lose his own father during his lifetime, then he has a personal identification also. Of course, he personally identifies with everybody, so he, he hurts when anybody dies. So chapter 3, verse 3, But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and keep you from evil. That's good. He protects us from the evil one. Verse 5, he directs our hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. I'm coming. You'll hear a song maybe near the end of this uh, production, if not at the end, but it's called I Am Certain. It's a beautiful song. I'm certain that my Lord is coming back for me. And verse 16, 316. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by 
all means. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Here's a good one. Verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord. I hope you do that a lot because there's a lot to thank him for. But here, Tim, uh, Paul says to Timmy, Timmy, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Jesus appoints us to service. He's directing us to do the works that he did. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. 2 Timothy 2, 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding in all things. First thing I notice is, if I don't consider what he says, I might not get that understanding. So I'm supposed to think about what's going on here and what the word says. The Lord, that's Jesus, not God. Obviously, God is energizing Christ. They're right in tune and so forth. But it says, Lord, yeah, because he's running the body, the assembly, the ecclesia. 311, persecution, affliction, which came to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endure, but out of them all, who delivered me? The Lord, and he will also deliver you. Chapter 4, verse 8, verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all those who love his appearing. The more you know and love someone, the more you anticipate their arrival. When you go to the airport, we did this in one day with the Creator. You see chauffeurs, disheveled chauffeurs with crooked hats sometimes, handmade sign, Mr. Jenkins. Next to them is a guy with roses, big card, waiting for the love of his life. Mr. Jenkins is not in They don't even know Mr. Jenkins. But this guy, yeah. That's how we should be in regard to Christ. 480 gives us the crown of righteousness. 414, oh, look at this one. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Jesus is going to repay our enemies. In other words, everybody's going to get what's coming to them. They're going to have to deal with Jesus. We may never get justice in this life in certain situations. Not uh, 17, verse 17, two more. The Lord stood with me, strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. He stands with us and gives us power. And verse 18, the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me into his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. No one is the dandruff on the body of of Christ. You cannot lose your salvation. You are a member of the body of Christ. You are sealed in Christ. And he will preserve you unto his heavenly kingdom. 1 John chapter 1, that's where we'll wrap it up. 1 John 1 and 2 verses 3 and 4. That which we have seen and heard declare, well, let's just read it from the beginning. That which was from the beginning, not the beginning of Genesis, from the beginning of this time when they walked with Christ, this administration, the beginning, Pentecost. The beginning doesn't always mean Genesis, okay? Today had a beginning. This segment had a beginning. Context is kind of important. 
which we've heard, seen with our eyes, looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. Yeah, the word became flesh. It's Jesus. They hung out with him. For the life was manifested, and we've seen it and bear witness and show unto you, especially John. John's writing this. That life in the coming age, which was with the Father in his mind as a possible alternative, and was manifested unto us. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have koinonia, full sharing, partnership. It's a very connective word in the Greek. And truly, our fellowship was with the Father, period. No. I was never told once upon a time that I could have fellowship, koinonia, intimate conversation, tell jokes, whatever, with his son, Jesus Christ. But that's what it says. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. So if I don't grasp these things, then my joy will not be full. Truth has a name, Jesus. Love has a name, Jesus. Peace has a name, Jesus. Joy has a name, Jesus. He is the embodiment of the fruit of the Spirit, the divine nature of God. And when we do what 1 Peter 3.15 says, I think we're reading that coming up, we sanctify. King James is wrong. It doesn't say the Lord God in our hearts. It reads, sanctify the Christ as Lord in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks us a reason of the hope that lives in us. So when we sanctify him as Lord and vigorously press into his heart, he welcomes us with open arms, he makes us whole, and he does all of these things for us that we read. So walk forth with him. Jesus.